Hello, everyone, and welcome to the e-commerce growth show. This is episode number 23. I am uh, Horatio Mitu, the head of marketing for OmniConvert, and with me is Ryan Boonstra from Sezzle. Ryan, great to have you here with us. Yeah, thanks, Horatio. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's an exciting topic, to, to say the least. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to be talking about um, quite a quite a new and uh, sizzling thing happening in e-commerce, which is uh, the buy now, pay later movement. Uh, and uh, you're you're one of the, the the best people in the in the world to talk about this. And really, we really can't uh, can't wait to hear your uh, opinion on everything. Yeah, I mean, we're in a, a very exciting uh, space in general. Um, it's taking off. Uh, obviously, it was over the last couple of years, but it's even accelerated even more due to COVID. Um, thankfully, we've been well positioned to react to the pandemic, where a lot of businesses, unfortunately, have not. Um, so for us, it's just how can we continue to build on that over the course of the next 30, 60, 90 days um, and into the future? Yeah, and this is this is a very important topic that I want to address uh, in our conversation. So just for everyone to know, we're going to have a pretty simple agenda. We're first going to talk to uh, to Ryan a little bit about who he is, what he does, what his company does. Um, then we're going to go a little bit over um, the, the whole concept of buy now uh, and uh, pay later, uh, how that all fits into the general uh, landscape in e-commerce, and then you know, we're going to have this little fireside chat about uh, how we think things are going and uh, where we think we should invest our our best um, efforts going forward. Let's do it. So, yeah, my, my first question to you, Ryan, is how did you enter e-commerce? When and why? Yeah, really good question. Um, so I guess the first, my first foray into e-commerce was probably back in middle school. Um, I used to, I was obsessed with collecting sports memorabilia. And so I used to sell autographed items, memorabilia, cards, and things like that on eBay. It made a decent amount, at least enough to, to fund my, my airsoft uh, love back in middle school. But no, the first, the first time professionally I, I jumped into e-commerce was with Sezzle. Um, I was still in, in school at the University of Minnesota. Um, was looking for something that I could do as an intern, particularly in sales as I went through my senior year. Um, and I found Sezzle, Minneapolis based. The office was just a quick bike ride from, from uh, my campus. So it was very easy. Um, and the business model just made sense. And I think the biggest thing for me was when I was looking at trying to find a, a place to work, um, was wanting to do something for a reason. I had back, back, a long time ago, I had always thought, okay, well, I could, I could sell whatever. I don't need to be passionate about it. It's not that difficult to do. Um, but it's just so much easier when you believe in it. And we're doing something for a mission. We're trying to financially empower the next generation. Um, we're trying to help people. We're trying to make people's financial situation better after utilizing the solution. Um, and for me, it just makes it much easier to have those kind of conversations. And um, so that's really where, how I jumped into the e-commerce professionally was when I started with Sezzle back in, I think what, 2018. Oh, so actually pretty, pretty, um, recently. Fairly recently. Yes. Yeah. And now you're an account exec for, um, for Sezzle. Yeah. So I, I was fortunate enough to be asked to move to Toronto actually last August to open up our Canadian expansion. Um, so we launched in Canada early in 2019. It was our first international expansion, uh, which for us was, of course, very exciting. We saw a ton of similarities between the, the U.S. and the Canadian market. So it just was um, a very logical transition. Um, and so now we're looking elsewhere. We're looking at India. We're potentially looking at a few countries in Europe. Um, and so we're, we're very excited about that. Well, that sounds pretty amazing. And um Sezzle is also a pretty young company. It's it was founded in 2016, right? Yeah, 2016. Um, we've got a, an amazing founding team that uh, builds up quite a bit of our, our leadership team now. Um, our, our two co two of our co founders, Charlie and Paul, um, our CEO and our president, actually met um, during their MBA at the University of Minnesota Carlson School. Um, and so, yeah, it's a fairly fairly recent product. Um, and it's, it's, it's still spectacular to look back at our growth because I, I mean, I still remember when I first started in 2018, um, our decks and our, our pitches are containing, Hey, we're working with 2000 retailers or 3000 retailers. 
and now we're approaching 20,000. And so to see that in, in just a span of my time, two years here, um, but even from the company's infancy in 2016, it's clearly spectacular. Um, but the best thing about it is that growth is is even more exacerbated over the course of the last three, four months or so. Yeah, it, it is it is quite a meteoric rise. And uh, congratulations to you guys for that. And uh, Thank to, you. What, <laughs> to what do you attribute this uh, this success? Well, I'd say, I'd say it's quite a few things. Like I said before, we put ourselves in a, a pretty fortunate position where we were, I don't want to call it pandemic proof because I don't think any business can, can really say that. Um, but for us, we, we were really positioned to take advantage of um, a lot of issues that are happening financially. Many people are or have lost their jobs or been furloughed or their small businesses have been hammered. And so they're looking for new and unique and flexible ways to pay that aren't going to come with the drawbacks of traditional methods like credit cards, high interest rates, or um, for whatever reason, taking out personal loans where, yeah, the Fed might cut interest rates to zero um, till what, I think 2023, but you're still not getting personal loans less than 10% interest. And so for us, I think having that positioning and just being able to assist in, in times of need has certainly helped. Um, you take a look at some of the anecdotes back from when COVID first hit, um, we actually allowed, so we allow traditionally one free reschedule for installments, which is a big differentiator for us. Um, but when COVID first hit, we gave additional reschedules for free to shoppers and the reception was tremendous. Uh, if you look at our trust pilot, people talking about, I lost my job and I was really worried about having to be able to make these installment payments on top of my rent, on top of whatever it may be. And for us being able to, to come in and say, hey, we, we have an agile tech solution. We can just add this feature um, and make your life a hell of a lot easier. And so that, that I think was probably the core, the core reason as to why our, our growth has been so meteoric over the last couple of months or so. Um, but then uh, again, I'll revert to both the mission that we have of financially empowering the next generation. And then I think our team in general, um, Charlie, our CEO founded a company called Passport um, before Sezzle, uh, which does white label parking apps for large cities around the world. And so we've always had this kind of tech core at, at, at our heart. Um, and so for us, it's been much easier to make those changes, add new features, launch with, with really exciting retailers in a very short span of time, where we saw interest in this kind of solution, not only from a consumer perspective, but also from a retailer's perspective, really heightened over the last couple of months. And so we had to transition. We just had a, a massive capital raise of $70 million, where I think last month alone, the last status, we, we hired 30 software developers. And so it's, 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 like I said, again, very exciting for us, um, but I think it's just the beginning. That sounds, that sounds really good. Now, I think we should tell our audience a little bit about what Sezzle actually does, um, what, what products you sell. Yeah, and more than happy to. And so I, I want to split it kind of in, in two different parts. So we focus on two entirely different things that have a lot of similarities. So the first one is um, offering an installment based solution to shoppers. So it's a buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to pay in four interest free installments over the course of six weeks. So when you look at the customer and the impact to them, really what we're doing is unlocking purchasing power that they may have not had otherwise. Many shoppers that are utilizing our solution don't have a credit card. They have subprime credit. Um, they have an, really an inability to access credit cards that um, maybe people in a much better financial situation have the ability to. And so for them, being able to split purchases up over six weeks, only pay a quarter of that purchase amount up front, gives them much more leeway and, and runway, I guess, with their finances so they can focus on the things that they need. And so for that, for the customer where they're not paying any interest, no fees provided they pay on time, they've got that free reschedule. Um, it's really an incentive, it, it, uh, a very incentivizing offer for, for the shopper to take up. They're not paying anything else. Yeah, it is. Um, Ryan, I think I lost you a little bit. Are you still here? Okay, let's let's just wait a second. Maybe Ryan will be back online. Version rate increases anywhere from from five percent um, amongst quite a few other e-commerce metrics. But at the end of the day, we increase the lifetime value of that shopper. 
And so from a retailer's perspective, it, it is essentially a no brainer to offer this kind of solution because they're seeing a significant amount of incrementality when they look at the volume that's coming through. Um, and they're, they're seeing more and, and more valuable volume coming through Suzzle. And so it's where in the past, it may have been a nice to have. Um, we're seeing it quickly become quite a necessity for online retailers. Yeah, right. Makes makes perfect sense. I think I, uh, I you dropped for a little bit, but um, now uh, I think everything is fine. With the did uh, what? Uh, what did we miss? Do you want me to repeat anything? I think I missed the switch between when you were talking about the benefits that consumers have versus the benefits that sh uh, that uh, um, stores have yeah. by using your your solution. Really, at the at the end of the day, the main focus for retailers is seeing more valuable shoppers. Um, yeah. Incrementality, and that comes from that higher average order value, higher conversion rate. Um, and then on top of that, we have marketing levers that we pull on um, that our retailers can take advantage of. You go to suzzle.com, you'll see the thousands of retailers that we work with based on categories, based on geographies. Um, both our Instagram and our email blasts have significantly high engagement. And so for retailers, they're not paying anything extra for us to, to promote our brands to our shoppers. So it's really a win-win across the board. And how do you monetize this? So, I mean, like I said before, we our goal is not to make money off of the shoppers. We want mm -hmm. this to be a, a really a cost-free solution for them because we know many of our, our shoppers are in difficult financial situations, simple as that. So for retailers, we do charge a processing premium. Um, so where with credit cards, you, you sign up with Shopify payments, for example, you could be paying on their standard rate 2.9% plus 30 cents per transaction. Our standard rate is higher than that. It's 6% plus 30 cents per transaction, but that's for a few reasons. So one of them being, we cover the entire risk of the transaction. So fraudulent transaction, missed or late payment, chargeback, all of that liability always falls on Sezzle. And so for the retailer, they don't need to partner with a, a fraud solution and pay an extra percent on top of that for Suzzle transactions because we already do that. So that kind of mitigates a little bit of the cost there. Um, but at the end of the day, when you look at uh, do a cost benefit analysis of um, the increase in, in processing costs, but compared to the amount of net new shoppers that are coming through at that higher volume, um, 99 time 99 percent of the time it, it makes a hell of a lot of sense for the retailer um it it makes sense for me <laughs> uh, <laughs> one other thing is um do you give the ability to uh e-commerce stores to handle all transactions uh, regardless of uh, of monetary value through the service uh, so basically were you asking just on the price point, like, do we, work yeah, with, pretty much. Uh, so uh, we have a single transaction cap of 1500 and then mm -hmm. a total cap of, of 4,000. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did just announce a really exciting partnership with ally, one of the leading consumer banks, um, arguably the most consumer friendly bank in the United States, um, for a, a, an installment program that's actually going to allow shoppers to go up to $40,000. And so for us, that's, that's coming next year. Um, we just announced it a couple of days ago, and we're we're so excited to now have the the opportunity to work with retailers that sell products above fifteen hundred. And so we we always knew that this was uh, going to be a necessity for us, uh, but we've grown and, and built our business on on the core of focusing on below that price point. And it's just kind of come the time for us where now we've got a large enough team, we've got enough bandwidth to to continue to develop these really exciting partnerships. Um, and Ally is just one of the many things we've got in the, in the pipeline that we're working on. Um, and I, I'm really excited to see that go live next year. And that's going to really unlock even more purchasing potential for um, our now creeping up on 2 million active shoppers. Yeah, sounds good. So what would you say is the, is the plan for the future? Um, basically being prepared to handle all sorts of transactions, uh, bigger transactions all of the time? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it, it really is a case by case basis mm. because I mean, many times our shoppers, we have, we have really high repeat usage rates. Mm -hmm. um, and so our shoppers are, they'll check out with some retailer. Um, let's say they check out with Untuck It in the US. 
Um, and they, they go through, they pay their installments off, and now they're introduced to the thousands of other brands that we work with at Sezzle. Um, they have the ability to continue to utilize the solution as, as I think 88% of them say they want to use this as their preferred method. So as we, as we look to the future, um, our goal is just to continue to add retailers and, and on the back of that, we'll continue to add shoppers. And so at the end of the day, we just want to continue to spread this message of, um, we're in this to assist you financially. And it's a solution that doesn't cost you anything. Retailers see the significant value. Um, and in all honesty, I see quite a few similarities in this market um, in the advent of the or, or to the advent of the, the credit card networks where um, to be able to or did we uh, sorry. did we cut out there? Oh, a little bit, but we're we're fine now. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying the I, I see a lot of similarities between this market and, and how highly competitive it is compared to the advent of the credit card networks, where now you go on really any large or really any online site and you have the ability to pay with the major four players, Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and Amex. Um, and I see I see this solution or, or this idea of buy now, pay later slowly transitioning into the same. Um, where we're actually seeing so power users, basically like the top 10% of buy now, pay later solution or users um, who tend to make up around 40% of the total volume. So th these are users that are really heavily relying on solutions like this. They don't just yeah. use one provider. They use two, three, four, because they know the value. And, and really, it's based on what retailers are these guys offered on. So they're hopping around from, from provider to provider. And so I, I anticipate in the future where you're going to see, and we have quite a few dual installs with some of our competitors, like like Afterpay and Firm and QuadPay, and we have no issue with that. And so the, the thing is, um, we're all we we continue to spread this message of, of flexibility and providing the the ability to make these payments over time without interest and and do it so easily, you get approved in one to two seconds. Um, and so there, there's really no downside to offering a multitude of options, just like with a credit card, you select, um, a premium credit card because of the rewards, um, providers like us are now coming out with reward solutions, or we've got our free reschedule. So shoppers are going to continue to rely on the providers that they value maybe a little bit more, but as we get more, uh, developed and entrenched in, in the retail market around the world, um, I think people are, are going to really start to ask for that flexibility and a multitude of options on, on checkouts. Yeah. Yeah. This sounds, uh, this sounds kind of, um, exciting. I think there is, there is quite a bright future in giving people a lot more flexibility in, in payments because yeah, especially in this, um, these weird times we've, uh, we've also seen, um, quite a, a shift in consumer behavior. People want more flexibility. They want more um, user-friendly solutions, especially now because being forced uh, to do everything online during this uh, this pandemic, uh, we've had a major increase in late adopters of uh, internet technology, let's say. And um, especially for, for guys who are new to uh, paying online, to making transactions in e-commerce stores and, uh, and things like that, I think this extra flexibility and, uh, and uh, ease of, um, of making transactions is going to be very important. And, and, and I'll tell you why, and I briefly touched on this before, um, and I think a lot of it is due to the repeat usage. If, mm -hmm. okay, say you go on a site and you see sales and you're like, okay, that's an enticing offering. Maybe I'll check it out. It's, it's a very quick and simple checkout flow. So why not? There's really no drawbacks. Um, if, that was, if, if that was the end all be all and they'll just occasionally use this product, okay, so be it. There's not going to be a lot of growth. Um, but in, in July, we hit our 19th straight month of improvement in repeat usage percentage. So it hit 88% in July. So our users aren't just using this, checking it out once and going, ah, that was, that was a nice product to use. Cool, I'm back to my credit card. They're on it again. They're on Sezzle.com looking for new brands and, and trying to find um, other exciting sites and retailers that they can use this solution on. And they're doing it. it like 88% repeat usage is not an insignificant statistic. And 19 straight months of improvement, we're going to continue to see that. Did you see uh, Sezzle working out in uh, some industries better than others? 
like for example have you seen something in fashion versus toys versus um other kind of uh, kinds of stores the the specific impact of the solution i would say is fairly industry agnostic um mm -hmm. the thing that the thing that is really the determinant on how successful this product will be the installment solution itself is the price point and mm -hmm. so i mean from if you're selling toys like you said around 80 bucks and there's a sweater that's around 80 dollars um, and you have a multitude of different SKUs to select from where a shopper has the option to pick a more valuable product, um, then there's going to be that ability to see significant incremental growth with a solution like Sezzle. Right now, before we launch this Ally product, yeah, we're not going to see as much of a lift with those higher ticket items um, because it's it's a little, our, our approval rate starts to teeter, of course, as, as the, or not teeter, but decrease as you get higher up and, and approach that limit. So uh, to answer your question, no, I, I, I don't think it really matters um, what mm -hmm. the industry is. We see maybe slightly higher success in some of those key industries um, like fashion and apparel and jewelry and cosmetics. Um, those, those statistics candidly blow it out of the water. And for retailers like that, um, you, it, it really is a no brainer and, and an essential add on for your site. Um, where in some other industries, it's just, uh, like you said, late adopters, um, it's just taking a little bit longer to, to pick up steam. Yeah, so from uh, from what I saw, um, I think fashion could be uh, one of the one of the main places this uh, this sort of solution could work because of the pretty low um, um, value per product or value per purchase. But there is also one uh, one other thing, uh, demographically speaking. Uh, do you have any any statistics that would point more to any uh, age group or more to any um, propensity of buying through Sezzle from any kind of? Uh... Yeah, so I mean, for us, it, it, it skews slightly more on the female side, um, slightly on the younger side, where Gen Z and, and millennials certainly make up a, a bulk of um, our shopper base. And this this is fairly standard if you look at just peer to peer payments in general, where um, I think what seventy around eighty percent of Gen Z is saying that they're utilizing some sort of P two P payment um, at least once per month. And so it's 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 for us it's really trying to capitalize on this market that is really quickly transitioning away from the traditional credit model that we and our parents grew up on. Um, and so we're, we're very well positioned for Gen Z and millennials and these the next generations to come um, as they look for new and unique and flexible and, and agile solutions like a Sezzle to really be their preferred method of payment. Yeah, sounds good. Um, what about offline stores? Do yeah, you it's operate a, it's in any offline stores? Yeah, so we just announced um, a new new uh, product feature a uh, couple of weeks ago where we now can do contactless payments in store um, via Google Pay and Apple Pay. And so this was a really exciting development for us, um, it was something we had been working on for a little while, um, and we wanted to make sure that we did it right. And so we just announced that um, really tap to pay in store. So that's going to be a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, and, and especially as we approach this holiday season, um, you go in, in most stores right now, there some stores, especially small businesses are saying, um, we'd prefer if you don't even pay in cash, we don't want the, the risk of cash changing hands. So contactless payments have seen an exorbitant rise. Um, I think Gen Z is, is still saying that they're comfortable shopping in store. And so to give them the ability to do so, um, and, and use the solution that they're preferring to utilize, like a Sezzle, um, just on their phone, it's it's gonna open up uh, even more potential for our retailers and our shoppers. Yeah, yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, so it would be fair to assume that uh, your ideal customer would be somewhere in the, in the Gen Z um, uh, area, right? Well, I would say it's it it makes up a, a larger portion of our user base. But that said, it, it's entirely dependent on a shopper's financial situation. Mm. Um, it, it it for some it's a need based solution where they truly need the ability to break up payments over time, um, and so they can focus on putting food on the table or, or things that are needed to be immediately paid in full. 
Um, but for us, the, the solution, like I said, it's industry agnostic. It's really age agnostic as well, because we have, we have the ability to provide a benefit to really any shopper's financial future. We just came out with a product called Suzzle Up um, about a month and a half ago. We're, we're the only ones in the industry to do this, but we actually give the option for some of our, our, our shoppers that have proven to succeed well with their repayment history to actually opt in to building their credit. And so where you'll see um, Experian, one of the major bureaus in, in the US spend quite a bit on marketing their new product Experian Boost, where really all it is is linking new payment methods or, or bank accounts to see if they can attribute your payment history with maybe boosting your score a little bit. With Sezzle, we know that we have a significant amount of shoppers that have never missed a payment. And we want to make sure that if, if we're truly trying to double down on our mission of financially empowering the next generation, why not take it a step further and give them the ability to truly, and you talk about empowerment, I talk about, I think it's opportunity. And so when, when you see a higher credit score and increase in, in utilizing Sezzle up to, to see that higher, uh, higher credit score, it gives you more opportunity for other financial avenues. When you go to take out a mortgage, when you go to take out a personal loan or refinance your student loans, a lot of that's backed off of that credit score. So when you're utilizing a solution like Sezzle, some of our competitors have gotten in hot water in, in Europe um, over the last year for impacting credit scores, uh, but not notifying shoppers about this, where for us, we're, we're entirely upfront about it. This is, it's something new. It's something, if you've proven to repay us and, and do that well, we'll give you the ability to do this. And, and the reason that we have those limitations on it is because we don't want a shopper that may be in a worse uh, financial situation and has missed a couple of payments um, to opt in and then see a, a decrease in score. And I, I want to be entirely clear that one of the greatest things in, uh, about our solution, but it's also one of the largest concerns is overconsumption. Okay, well, if you're allowing someone to pay with something that they maybe couldn't afford otherwise, why is that a good thing? But for us, it, it, it's actually the entire opposite because if you miss a payment um, and you're late, we're not charging you interest. We charge you a one-time capped late fee of $10, which will actually refund if you pay us back in 48 hours. But will lock you out of your Sezzle account. That's the worst ramification. We never send you to collections or interest, like I said. And so we're designed to prevent overconsumption because the instant we see a shopper have an inability to pay us back, we lock them out of using Sezzle. And when we talk about nearly 90% of our users wanting to use this as their preferred method, they're trying so hard to really get back into a good standing with us uh, because they want to use it elsewhere. And so that, that model has worked incredibly well for us. And I'm really excited to see how over the next couple of months and, and years even, um, as we'll, we'll continue to see anecdotes and stories of, hey, I, I boosted my credit score with, by uh, 10, 15 points with Sezzle um, simply by paying my installments off on time. And for someone that's maybe teetering between fair and good credit and good and excellent, it gives you the opportunity to maybe get even different cards, which you can get. Uh, obviously, there are significant advantages to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I would have wanted to ask you how you deal with fraud, but you did sort of answer it. If you want to uh, provide a little bit more info about. It. Yeah. So, I, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, you're right. We, we touched on it. We cover the risk. So if the retailers don't really need to worry about it. Um, but we have, we have a really, really exciting fraud team, um, in, in, uh, our Minneapolis office that's doing quite a few things that are, are very unique to really tracking fraud, um, looking at sign up and checkout flow and determining how quickly someone is going through the checkout to see if say it's a bot or not. And we're able to determine whether or not it's a fraudulent transaction. And so we've, we've considerably, um, especially over the last couple of months or so invested in this team. Um, because we know that really at the, the backing of, um, I mean, as a financial institute, not institution, but solution, um, we have to make sure that we are really buttoned up in this area. And so that, that team is uh, really vetting business to go off of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So. What would you say are the top three challenges that you encounter working in this field for you as a professional and for you as a company? 
That's a, a good question. Um, I would say in Canada in particular, it's, it's just about getting the message out of this product. Like we talk about early adopters and who's going to be a laggard on, on the solutions like this. And whenever you open up into a new market, obviously you're going through that entire cycle over again, um, even though there may be some similarities from market to market. Um, so you're really trying to draw similarities to um, from, from market to market for us, it's, it's really just trying to get the word out, which isn't really difficult. Um, but it's, it's sometimes when you're trying to make comparisons to like merchants, um, when you're expanding into a new territory and you don't have any, um, it's a difficulty, but it's a challenge our team has certainly taken up and, and been successful on. Um, if you look at our launch in Canada in particular, we launched early last year and we're about to hit a thousand active retailers in Canada, probably within the next couple of weeks or so. And so th that's really exciting for us. Um, another challenge is, is probably just um, really getting our mission out and really explaining the fact that there's not a lot of liability on the shopper's side, because I, I talked about that question of overconsumption and why would I let my shoppers do this? Or why would I, why would I allow a shopper to pay in installments for $30 soap or whatever it may be? Um, and so it's just trying to prove that value, which isn't a unique obstacle by any means, especially for a salesperson. Um, but it, it, our business model simply also has to change from geography to geography, um, whether that be pricing, um, obviously interchange rates for um, credit card processing vary from, from geography to geography. So we're working quite diligently to come up with a pricing structure that um, is both beneficial for our retailers as well as us as we try to create a sustainable business yeah all right so you said that one of the challenges is um is uh, let's say adapting to different markets um what would you say um what would you say constitutes a good market for you guys i think you dropped off a little bit again Yep. I think, okay. uh, I think I think I lost your issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. All good now. No, no. I think we're good. Yeah. What were you saying? I, uh, I yeah. missed the question. Yeah. So I was saying, what constitutes uh, what constitutes a good market for you guys? Like, well, where where would you uh, try to expand further on from now on? I would you, or, or let, let me put it this way, would you rather go to high income uh, countries where you think you could um, have like the, um, the biggest average order values and uh, the biggest, uh, you know, impact in that, in that sense? Or would you rather go to, let's say, uh, countries who don't have such a high income and where you could um, help more people? using this solution well i guess if, if if that's a question it's probably the latter as we try to advance that mission um but i don't think income level is is the primary determinant on where we expand mm -hmm. there are there's so many different factors and criteria that go into where we're going to expand to next we'll look at um really how familiar is this market with the idea of installments? Not even just buy now, pay later, but if you look at South and Central America, they are so used to paying in even um, products that are under $10 in installments. Just a, It's just a portion of their way of life. And so we need to, to determine, okay, well, if we try to really release a solution there, um, is it gonna be well received by the public? Is this gonna be too different of a product than um, what they've been used to? How are we gonna be able to penetrate so I, I think it's it's trying to find that middle ground of are they used to a similar solution and how can we come in and prove that Sezzle is, is a value add alongside of these models that have proven successful over the last few years. And so that's that's one of the reasons that we selected India because they have similar solutions as well. And we're running a pilot there right now and it's it's gone quite well so far. So we're, we're really excited to see um, how these new markets and new launches work for us because every market is isn't there are of course similarities, but um, going to be a little bit different. So I, I'd say the criteria is is really just related to customer perception 
and just trying to find a product market fit. Because at the end of the day, if, if we can't get retailers on board with this, then there's not going to be a lot of success. So, so for us, it's where can we find our connections? Where can we find like, like-minded retailers that also have the same say ethos or mission of, of what our retailers in the U S and Canada are, are now more established markets have. And I'd say that's probably going to be more of a factor on our international expansion than say, just looking at the overall uh, per capita income of, of a specific region. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. So let's, uh, let's switch a little bit to uh, your outlook on how e-commerce is, uh, is uh, right now and uh, how you feel about, uh, about working in this, uh, in this landscape. Um, first of all, what, what do you find exciting about, uh, about e-commerce nowadays? Are you still here? I think you may have dropped off a little bit. I think I lost you again. Yeah, just a little bit. I think you're back now. All right. All good? uh, You want to repeat the question? Yeah, sure thing. Okay, so what do you find exciting in the world of e-commerce today? Well, I mean, for me, I've always been quite passionate about say fashion, for example. And so it's, it's really exciting to work with retailers that um, I have in my closet or have a buyer and, and to be able to work with their executive teams on how can we make this product resonate and, and how can we assist your shoppers? So sites like in, in Canada are launches with altitude sports and, and reigning champ who sells into Saks and, and Nordstrom and, and some very significant well-known retailers around the globe. Um, that's really exciting for me because I, I mean, I get to, you walk into a meeting, just show up wearing that kind of gear and it's, 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 it's exciting. Um, but uh, aside from that, um, this entire market obviously has just exploded over the last couple of months. If you even just take a look at say Shopify stock, for example, it's one of the best performers over the last few months because people are realizing this opportunity of online shopping and, and, uh, Um, Ryan, I think I lost you a little bit again. Yep. So now I think we're good. I can't tell if it's your side or mine. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, but I guess we'll, we'll find out later. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. But at, at the end of the day, uh, I think quite a bit of it, it, it is exciting because um, so we did a, a really big research study with the Center for Generational Kinetics and, and a pretty well-known researcher named Jason Dorsey. And he anticipates that 95% of retailers in the US are going to offer a buy now, pay later solution by 2023. And so for us to look at the state of the market now, even though we're well, well entrenched in the retail market in North America, the potential is still tremendous. And so, yes, we're seeing success right now, but knowing that the, the growth outlook and opportunity over the next few years is still there, that's probably the most exciting thing for our team because we get to continue to grow. When I started, we had around 30 people and we've got nearly 200 globally now. And that's, those numbers are not going to slow down. Last year, um, I'll have to look up again, but our, our revenues um, in, in 2019 were at, at 16 million. Um, and we are going to abs- and that was up 884% from the year before. And so when we look at, when we come out with our 2020 numbers, it's going to be ridiculous. In Q2 alone, our, our merchant fees were 10.6 million, which is similar to, to what our total revenue is going to end up being. So if you look at the end of the year, um, and what the potential is for years down the road, it, that, that's what excites me. Okay. Yeah. Sounds fun. Um, what is. What is the thing that annoys you right now in e-commerce, if there is such a thing? Um, I mean, as a salesperson, it's, it's, it's when someone doesn't see the value that you're placing directly in front of them. But I also think that's probably an excitement, too, because it gives you an ability to overcome an objection and, and truly try to prove 
that what you're selling is going to come at, at an added benefit, not only to that retailer itself, but also to their, their shoppers. Um, and so then I, I guess the, the only nitpicky thing is probably just ensuring that our technology is, is well integrated with different solutions. So obviously with a multitude of different e-commerce solutions around the world, um, they all have different integrations to be able to appear at their checkout. And so for us, our, our partnerships team um, has worked tirelessly. We're, we're about to launch a full integration with Big Commerce here shortly, um, which will open us up even to, to even more retailers. Um, we've been piloting that for the last couple of months or so. But um, I guess that, that's probably just a, a nitpicky annoyance. It's just making sure that we can really have the, the ability to work with these retailers. Um, but th not to say that uh, I mean, our, our partnerships team is doing a tremendous job at building these integrations. We've got direct integrations with practically all of the large and major players. Um, but as, as new solutions start to pop up, we just got to make sure that we're on top of it and continue to build those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, usually I, uh, I always find the answers to what bugs you very interesting from all yeah. of our um, from all of our guests. Um, <laughs> so this is a this is a more personal one, but I think it's uh, it's really cool. And usually, Valentin, uh, our CEO, always asks this of our guests. So imagine you're twenty years old, right? You're just in college. What advice would you give? to yourself when you were 20 years old to, I don't know, make, make yourself better? Well, so when I was 20 years old, um, I'm 24 now, so that would have been four years ago where, where Saza would have even been, I mean, we still would have been around, but would have been just really at the beginning of our infancy. So I would have told myself to go join Saza beforehand so I'd have a, a lower, lower grant price on my stocks. but. Other yeah. than that, um, I, I mean, for me, it's it's um, just continue to do research and, and more research into budding and expanding markets because that that's what's going to provide you with the most opportunity. I had no idea what this solution was back when I was 20 years old. And so I, I think, yeah, I, I joined at a fairly early stage in general, but um, to go back and, and even further, and if I could hop on at, at the amount of say five people i think that would have been pretty thrilling as well so just working at an early stage company is, is always excited me um the, the job other job i worked during school i sold web development and design services for a, a pretty small boutique uh agency based out of phoenix um there's a team of five and so i really like that that small environment because if anything it gives you the ability to really take the reins on whatever initiatives you're running um, not to say we don't have, have that autonomy at Sazo right now, but um, I'm sure it would be yeah, on a, a entirely different scale when I was 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, what What do you feel about uh, working from home right now, and how is your company dealing with this? It, so our our company's done a, a really good job um, of at least giving the option to transition back into the office. So in Minneapolis, um, we allow a limited amount of people to go back to the office, wear masks, social distance, um, be intelligent about how they're, they're handling themselves personally, um, and professionally during the workday. Um, obviously working from home will have its difficulties. Um, so with me working from Canada and then moving back to the States temporarily just to be with family and friends, um, the nice thing right now, I just moved into a temporary place in Chicago where I no longer have my parents' dogs barking during every call, which candidly can be a decent segue, uh, but it's a slight amount of an annoyance when you got a miniature schnauzer that barks at practically anything from the garbage truck to a, a little four-year-old riding her tricycle down the street. So at, at the end of the day, jokes aside... Um, We've done, a, we've done a tremendous job of still being productive as we work from home. Um, and so I think the, our, our, our senior leadership team has done a tremendous job of, of providing that flexibility. And if anything, I think transparency is probably the most important portion of it and just saying, hey, we're working on this. Uh, we're working on transitioning back to the office whenever it's safe. Uh, we've always had a really strong value of working from the office, not only just due to camaraderie, but I think collaboration um, and, and getting creative minds flowing. And I think in sales in particular, if you look at just what, what we're up to, um, it just gives you the ability to even better understand the difficulties that some retailers are encountering 
because we're, we're all focused on different territories, different geographies, different industries. And the issues, while they, they may be similar, um, some of them take conversion rates, for example, they, they could be entirely different just based on, on the price point of the, the what a respective product. So I think that's something that I certainly miss of being in the office and being able to collaborate and hopping off a call and just like, Hey, can you help me dissect this? And what did I do? What did I do wrong? And it's, it's, you still have the potential and ability to do that working from home, but it just makes it much easier in the office. So I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, a future where we can definitely transition back to the office. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page with you. I think that just from a productivity standpoint, working from home had absolutely no effect. I mean, everybody was, if not more productive, but it's it's kind of hard to keep the the values of the company um, intact and to keep the the same feeling of familiar of familiarity between people. And I I think that being together somehow reinforces us. It uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, like uh, one plus one equals three. Um, being in the same space, we get the chance to bounce ideas off of each other. And um, I think especially for, for like giving feedback and especially receiving feedback, it's much easier to, to have a, a, a conversation face-to-face -face than over the phone, over any kind of uh, digital media. But we do what we can. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I have a lot of admiration for our, our new employees, our new hires that are, are joining a team that they've never met in person. And so yeah. we just, our new chief revenue officer, Veronica Katz, who came over from PayPal, she's, uh, she's met a few employees in person, but never truly been in the office with everyone. Um, and so there's, uh, you, you really have to look up to the people that are, are doing this and joining entirely new teams um, and coming in day one and making an impact right out of the gate. Um, because for, for many people, that's something that's quite difficult to do. Obviously there's, there's a lot of value in, like you said, being close, uh, interpersonal, interconnected with, with other people in the office. Um, and so to come in day one, like I said, make an impact, um, and, and just feel like a part of the team right out of the gate. Um, I'm sure some companies do have difficulties with that. I think, yeah, I agree with you. It's difficult to, um, truly exude the values of, of the culture that you've tried to build, um, that we've tried to build over the last five years or so. Um, but our team has done a really good job. And we are our hiring team and our talent acquisition team. Um, we always make a really strong point throughout the hiring process of, hey, like you could, you could be incredibly qualified, you could be an incredibly great fit for, for um, this role in particular, but we've got to have alignment when it comes to our values. And so we, we've made pretty damn sure that when we're hiring and making a good decision on who we're bringing on board, they're going to exude the character and the values and what we stand for at Sezzle. And so it's, it, it's, it's awesome to see and, and see all these new faces and, and just see how excited they are to join the team. Um, and every, every single new employee that I've met from interns to uh, to full time, um, they, they've just been so thrilled to join our, our fast growing team, and I, I'm I'm so thankful to be a part of it. Um, and it's it's only going to continue. Yeah, congratulations for for that. What we try to do at OmniConvert is that every time we bring in a new hire, especially now, um, we have this uh, these meetings that are happening every two weeks, where we just have an all hands and. In this all hands meeting, uh, we have the young, the the, the new recruits, um, you know, speak about themselves a little bit, and then get questions and answers uh, from everybody in the team because, you know, that's our way of making them known to the company and getting them accustomed to our tone of voice, our personality, our uh, our values in the end. Because yeah. yeah, we we do try to hire people who are. Uh, who are uh, fit with uh, with our corporate culture, but we also try to instill it into them w when they come, uh, when they get hired. Yeah, that's yeah. that's an awesome idea. Yeah. So um, I I think one of the one of the last things I want to talk about is what would what advice would you give to uh, people who are just now thinking of 
you know, creating their own their their own little e-commerce store. Um, well, that's that's a great question for me actually. As I'm I'm building one myself. Oh. Um, I'm okay. working with a retailer um, based out of Toronto called Antihero Thirteen. Um, it's a high-end menswear retailer that sells some of candidly the nicest fabrics that that you'll ever feel. Um, and so uh, this is a piece of advice I actually got from uh, Gary V back in uh, in Vegas at a show that we did um, because I this is before I had even considered building something myself. Um, and I asked him, I was like, hey, what advice would you have to someone that's still in love with their full time job but wants to do something on the side? Um, and he goes, just do not try to do it too quickly. He's like, I always wanted to own the Jets when I was a kid. I'm not trying to do I'm not doing that shit until I'm 75. And so I think for, for, for a young person that's trying to build a brand, you can't do it that quickly. And you got to make sure that you have all of your bases covered. Um, we're going to be launching with um, a really exciting um, athleisure brand called Story. Um, I think uh, they launch in two days on the 26th. And this has been years in the making for them in marketing and product development and, and manufacturing, making sure you have everything right. Um, so at the end of the day, don't try to do things too quickly. Make sure that you're prepared. Make sure that you're planned. And you have a roadmap, um, and just be able to encounter hiccups. Um, because it, it, many times, when when something happens, um, it, people get flustered, uh, and and they their plans go up in the air, and they try to make quick decisions without thinking uh, about what potential ramifications they may have. Um, so as you try to to build and, and grow a brand, you have to make sure you have a plan as, as a unique as, as that is. Um, but but on top of that, just make sure you're always testing things. Um, I've always believed in the fact that smaller retailers, especially ones that are are willing to take risks and be more agile, have a massive advantage over their larger counterparts where decision making, I mean, even you look at the sales cycle, for example, you could be talking to a small retailer and get them launched with Sezzle in, in five minutes where you could talk to a larger retailer. I'm still talking to some people I've spoken with um, a year ago. And so you've got a huge leg up if you you have the ability to add tools like Sezzle and, and really with the flip of a switch. And so, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, don't try to do things too quickly. Make sure you have a plan and always be willing to test and try because if it doesn't work, you can remove it. But if it does, um, you're going to be sure pretty damn happy that you, you went ahead and, and gave it a shot. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for yeah. for everything. Um, if you want to ask me anything, please feel free. We still have seven minutes to go, and um, yeah. So I guess I guess for you, what's the what's the most um, like exciting piece of advice that you've had someone give um, with that question that you guys always ask here at the end? Uh, the the be the best advice that we got while asking that question. Yeah. Well, I think usually it's it's somewhere along the terms between um, don't really um, there is this uh, this uh, thing. So if you set up your expectations too high, you might have a very good chance of uh, reaching much lower than that. So the, usually what, uh, what advice we get in this section is pretty much set your expectations to something that you can manage. Don't make it easy, but set it to something real that you could actually get to. Because if you're going to set, uh, set expectations way too high, then you're probably going to get flustered, like you say, and uh, you're just not going to do it. So yeah, I think, yeah, I think that that is the, the best advice because... Right now, there is this um, really strong drive for people to uh, start quitting corporations, start making their own little handmade business and uh, stuff like that, and uh, and getting into business while not having that much experience. So you need to properly set your expectations. You need to put all of your drive and all of your thoughts and all of your um, energy into doing it, but don't be disappointed too easily. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. So, um, is there any other thing you would like to ask? 
Uh, nothing else for me. Do we uh, are we opening it up to our, our live viewers or what? Uh, how do you typically like that? Andy? Yes, yes. If we have any questions, then uh, I will um, I will gladly. We do have one question. Um, how do you make people? How do you make sure that people are paying later? Um, well, for us, we do we do a phenomenal job of notifying the customer when their installments are coming up, whether that be email, text message, app notifications through our, our um, Android or iOS application. Um, so just in, in informing the customer that these installments um, or that specific transaction will be pulled out of either their bank account, their debit card, their credit card, whatever they have linked. So I think transparency is really a key there. Um, and at the end of the day, the driving factor for repayment is not the notifications. It's not the worry of, of interest or fees because that's, that's really a non-factor with us. It's the desire to use the solution again. We've built a solution that is so valuable to retailers as proven with those repeat usage statistics that shoppers are actually working diligently to pay us back so they can use it again. So for us, the, the whole business model is just designed for shoppers to pay us back because they want to, not because they have to. Yeah. I got another question here. What is your favorite deal you have won with a customer against a competitor? Um, mine is, is probably the, the deal launching with Altitude Sports in Canada. Um, we ran a head-to-head -head test against our, our direct competitor, Paybright. Um, where they they tested us. They have two sites. They have Altitude Sports and The Last Hunt, which is their discount site. Um, and they did a head-to-head -head test and just uh, tested our solution against theirs. Um, what capabilities do we have just on the site specifically, but also those marketing levers that I, I spoke of before. Um, it, was, it was really a team effort where we had to lean on um, our risk and data decisioning team to determine um, how we could best handle this transaction from our marketing team to coming up with uh, collaborative efforts to promote the solution to our, our account managers that are ensuring that we're providing adequate feedback in response to um, any issues that may arise. And so at the end of the day, we in Yahoo Finance actually picked up a, a report just on it and the rationale behind why they selected us. Um, and there are a few factors, just superior technology, our dedication to our mission and um, working with young customers. And at the end of the day, it's providing that incremental value. And so for us, it was it was thrilling to have won that, thrilling to have been able to launch that, um, where especially for a Montreal-based retailer that has a, a pretty good grip on the Canadian market in particular and is looking at growing in the U.S., um, it was a big win for me. It was a big win for the team. Um, so that was, that was very exciting. Awesome. Let's see if anyone has another question. Not so far. So Ryan, thanks a lot for everything, and um, I wish you all the all the success in the world. <laughs> and uh, I think, yeah. Is there anything, yeah. uh, any any question from you guys anymore? Doesn't look like it, but yeah, Horatio, yeah. I, I really appreciate the the opportunity to come on and chat. Um, obviously, we're really excited about the opportunities um, that have been afforded to us as a company and, and personally and professionally. And so, um, keep a close eye on us. Um, we're, we'll be doing some some big things and have some very exciting launches here coming up shortly. But you and I, let's let's stay in touch. Yeah, thank you, man. We'll keep in touch. Thanks. All right, thanks, Horatio. Talk to you soon. Bye.